everyone. Welcome back to another day, another made-for-TV drama. Today, Alfia and I will be discussing the 2018 remake of No One Would Tell. My name is Jennifer Rainier Woods. I am the author of the book Deadly Guide, The Search for the Killer Made-for-TV Thriller, which is available in paperback through Barnes & Noble and as an ebook on your Nook or Nook app. So if you're looking for a specific TV movie from the early 90s, um, that's a great resource for you. Um, I am also an admin alongside Althea Williams on the Lifetime Movie Club fan page on Facebook. And I'm also an admin on the Lifetime Movie Channel fan page on Facebook. Um, please feel free to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss my new content. Um, for my second episode, Alfie and I discussed the original No One Would Tell starring Candace Cameron and Fred Savage that came out back in 1996. And now the two of us are back to discuss the remake. So let's get started. Now, I love 90s music, but I think the music in the remake was better overall. There was this sort of moodiness to it without being trite. As I said in an earlier episode, the theme song for the 1996 No One Would Tell is very similar to the theme song for the 1997 version of Dying to Belong, um, only with a tweak in the lyrics. It had this sort of Chris Isaac feel to it, and I love Chris Isaac, but it just felt a little overdone to me. And now, knowing it's a cookie-cutter tune, forget it. I definitely like the songs better in the remake of No One Would Tell. I found them intriguing and a little bit haunting. An example of a song I liked in the remake was Chase the Devil by, I'm probably going to butcher this, but uh, Seal Lean. Lean spelled like a lean on the house, so I'll go with that. Um, it's a perfect song title given the subject of the movie, you can be sure. So that was a good song, Chase the Devil, and then there were several others that I liked too. In the remake, Matria Scarwinner plays the lead role. I'm not familiar with her, and I'm not sure if I pronounced the name right, but she looks like a typical teenager and did a great job playing a young girl experiencing a range of different emotions as she navigates the awkwardness of young love and the dangers of an abusive, toxic relationship. The main character is named Sarah as opposed to Stacy. It's a nice, simple, classic name. Nothing wrong with Stacy, but Sarah feels more timeless. Sarah's boyfriend is named Rob as opposed to Bobby. It's funny because he kind of reminded me of Robert Pattinson as Edward in Twilight, which made him a little hard to take seriously. He wasn't built like a wrestler, and he didn't walk like one. Instead, he plays Rob as the kind of rich, gangly loser who might hang out on online chat rooms and whine about being a virgin. Only he was definitely not portrayed as a virgin in the movie. He just gave off that vibe, I would say. Maybe that's why he was so violent with Sarah. Maybe he was compensating for the fact that he was essentially a wimp. When he turned to look at Sarah screaming on the bleachers in that one scene near the beginning of the movie, he didn't have the same glint in his eye that Fred Savage did. That glint that was both mysteriously sexy and also a little bit dangerous. He just looked like a deer in headlights. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Rob was a loser with a capital L. So overall, Cal and Potter did a great job. He's an actor I've never heard of outside of this movie, and I would dare say he was even more brutal than Fred Savage's Bobby. It was just really hard to watch the way he talked to Sarah, just completely out of control. That bruise he left on her shoulder blade, ouch. And seeing her walk around with blood trickling from her forehead, hiding it from her mom. I was glad when Sarah drew the line and told him, no more. The guy was just nuts. Kind of cute to a teen girl, I guess, but Sarah's friend was right. The sweet Rob doesn't cancel out crazy Rob, and he was bat crazy. I thought Sarah's friend was great in this. I can't even pronounce the actress's name, but she played the friend as extremely supportive, really trying to stand up for Sarah and be there for her at all times. I really felt the connection between the two of them in a way I didn't in the original. Same with Sarah and her mother, played by Shannon Doherty. I felt the connection there, too. I think the remake did a great job drawing out the relationships between the characters. I'm not sure how I felt about the courtroom scenes being interspersed throughout the movie as opposed to just being at the end. I think it was interesting the way they did that. And in a way, it, it makes the ending seem less rushed, I suppose, because the whole movie was building up to that point. I thought it was interesting the way Sarah's mother chides the lawyer, saying, don't blame Sarah's friend for not speaking up. Blame the boy blame the guilty party. 
That shows how our attitudes have really changed since the 90s. And I think that was the movie trying to get away from victim blaming, especially in the case of Sarah's friend, who really did try to help, even though she didn't go to an adult. You know, she tried to be supportive and to get Sarah out of that abusive relationship. Mira Sorvino played the judge. That was the one other actress besides Shannon Doherty, whom I was already familiar with going into this. She gives an impassioned speech at the end about how partner abuse is a quote-unquote war that we are fighting and that needs to be taken more seriously. I felt that the movie took the subject matter seriously without pinning the blame on any one particular person or group of people. And I think that was the movie's way of saying we all need to take this seriously and we all need to do something about this. I felt this movie had a little more of an understated feel to it. It didn't go for the shock value as much. It didn't open with a big dramatic death scene. It didn't show the body bag being unzipped. Um, there was a little more subtlety in that way, but that didn't make it any less horrific. Another thing I forgot to mention. In the remake, Sarah meets up with Rob outside of a coffee shop at the end, as opposed to taking his call at a bowling alley. I think I liked the simplicity of the coffee shop meetup in the remake, though I didn't really understand what role Jacqueline played in Sarah going off with the guy she'd cut ties with, and why Jacqueline, who clearly had the hots for Rob, would have wanted anything to do with bringing Rob and Sarah together again. I kind of felt that the remake put her in there because a similar character was in the original. Maybe she was inspired by someone in the real case, I'm not sure. But she felt unnecessary to me. I also thought it was weird that it went from daylight to nighttime really quickly when he drove Sarah away from the coffee shop. Once she got in the car, it seemed a little rushed, like the plot needed to get Sarah from point A to point B, and the script was written to do exactly that and no more. That's the thing with true crime. We know that something happened, and we're trying to make sense of what beats led up to that final showdown. And sometimes it takes some forcing square pegs into round holes to get you there because you just don't understand. You can't understand because in this case you would have to be insane to comprehend how something this crazy could occur. I don't know if the original movie did much better getting us from point A to point B. It was just handled differently and I guess it's a matter of personal opinion which way was better. I did like that the friend in the car was passed out drunk and when he questioned where Sarah was, Rob was like, I already dropped her off a while ago. Shows the kind of mind games guys like Rob will play. And it made it more understandable why the friend didn't come forward right away. He was confused. And the purse being left behind was more sinister because the friend didn't quite know what it meant. I didn't believe for a second, though, that Sarah's mother would go rummaging through Rob's car right there in his driveway in broad daylight. That scene put in there for dramatic effect. So as you can see, there are some pluses to the remake and also some questionable things. Anyway, what are your thoughts, Althea? How would you sum up this 2018 version? Hi, Jennifer. Thank you again for letting me join your podcast. We're going to be talking about No One Would Tell, the 2018 remake. I'm glad they made a remake. I know a lot of people don't like when they do remakes. I'm a big fan of that. If you're going to make a remake, make sure it's good. This one was very good. At first, I was like, okay, I don't know. Because it was kind of like, okay, it started off slow, but then it started picking up the pace. And I was like, okay, this is really good. Robbie and Sarah, their relationship and the things she was going through. And, and Robbie was more abusive, if if we may say. I was like, wow, he's, he's really doing a lot of stuff to her. And her friend Nikki was there for her every step of the way. Nikki tried to be there for her. I liked how um, one of the young gentlemen stood up for her when he she got hit at the prom, the little, little dance or whatever. I was like, wow, they're really standing up for her in this movie. And she's really, it looked like she was going to, it looked, I'm going to go ahead and say, it. I was, I had forgot about the ending about the other movie. I was like, maybe she won't get killed in this one. But sadly, her life was ended and it was so sad. And... Her mama really fought for her justice. The other one she did too, but this movie it was like it was a it was it had it had it wrote its own story. It was different from the known would tell the 1995. I think it was 1995 the first one came out, but it was different than that one. And I'm glad that they made an updated version of No One Would Tell <laughs> because kids go through what Sarah went through. And um, 
the original came out in 1996. So, obviously, you're off. Can I compare Stacy and Sarah? Stacy and Sarah were two different characters. They were both looking for love. And they thought they found it. Stacy thought she found it in Bobby. And Sarah thought she found it in Robbie. Robbie and Bobby were two different characters. Robbie was more abusive than Bobby was, in my opinion. Stacy and Sarah. Sarah looked like, uh, like I said, I thought the whole movie was going to be like Sarah was going to be okay. I get to see her go off to college. I didn't get to see that. I got to see another young lady life get ended. And um, Nikki actually met one of Robbie's girlfriends at the party. And um, they talked or whatever. And they really talked about some things. And she was like, he was sweet. And then he wasn't. And then it was just issues she dealt with. And I was like, wow. It it was a lot, y'all. It was a lot. And I like that that no one would tell the remake was really good. It has some of the some of the stuff they have from the no one would tell the nineteen ninety six version, but they own, they put their own little twist in it and they gave it the new updated version, the cell phone version. Because and no one would tell nineteen ninety six version, he was calling the house phone, he wanted her to be by the house phone. And when he he was um the only thing different is he came in the night, um, the 2018 one. He came to the house when Sarah's mother called him because she was looking for him. Remember in the movie, I don't think he came to her house. She came to his house and that's how she found the purse or whatever. And she went to his house and was looking in his truck. And I want to say how you didn't see nobody looking in your truck from your window. You, you got to hear your car. You got to hear doors closing and everything. Hey, heck, anytime I hear something close, I'm I'm jumping and look out the window myself. And she found her daughter's purse in there. And, and in the 1996 version, they had to tell about, you know, looking the lake or whatever. And they went to the lake house in the, the 2018 one to go find out where the daughter was at. It was just, they picked, picked and choose some of the stuff from 1996 and then they did their own little thing in 2018 and it was good so i give it a 10 out of 10 it was actually in my opinion i think it was a little a little better than the old one um because it's a new updated version you know we're older now we have better technology like when it comes to cell phones stuff like that even though that's not you know what's called but it's just to show people how a story like this how stuff like this happened still even this day about domestic violence and relationships. And I thank you so much, Jennifer, for letting me be a part of this um, episode. If you haven't watched No One Would Tell 2018, I suggest you go find it on streaming services and watch it because I liked it. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for joining me today, Althea. As always, a pleasure. Um, I really appreciate hearing your thoughts and you express them very well. Um, So that concludes our episode for today, folks. Um, That's the remake of No One Would Tell. um, Came out in 2018. You can buy it on Amazon um, Instant Video. Uh, You can also get it on the Lifetime Movie Club if you subscribe to that, but it doesn't look like it's on Amazon's Lifetime Movie Club channel, just on the actual Lifetime Movie Club app, I guess. Um, And you can buy it on Vudu. That's V-U-D-U. So a few different ways to watch it. Um, You know, maybe you'll be cooler than I am and be like, no, the original is better. Don't care. But, you know, I, I would honestly recommend to give the remake a shot because you might like it. Um, it, It's really well done. And I would give it four out of five stars. So until next time, folks, have a great day.